Welcome to the Suncoast Spotlight webinar, streaming on YouTube and Facebook. Today we're setting the record straight as we focus on our issue, Get the Facts, Fighting Fake News. You'll learn how to verify the accuracy of sources' statements and how to recognize the distinction between fact, myth, and opinion so you can get the story right. We want to hear from you. So please, submit your questions in the comments section, and don't forget to include your name and your school. And now, here's your moderator, John Wilson. Hello there, and good morning, wherever you happen to be. I am John Wilson, and uh, welcome to a discussion about a favorite word of ours, truth, uh, separating fact from fiction, which we sometimes call fake news a word that really haunts all of us in journalism. And, and I suspect as a, as a viewer or someone who's interested in developments, that, that word is, a, is really a horrible term. It's a term that is not as new as you may think. It actually goes back to the 1800s. You can find it in history, but it was in 2016, if you're keeping records on this, when it became popular to be used as political speech to describe a, a point of view, which we knew went in every different direction. Uh, you can, in fact, find that term in use throughout history, by the way. Fake news. It's not as new as it may appear to be. Uh, you're going to hear from two professional uh, journalism experts here in a moment. We'll get to them. They're going to tell us all about the word truth and how it's applied and how we deal with it. Uh, but one thing to start with, and I want to tell you something about my favorite network commentator going back to the 1960s when I when I started. Uh, his name was Eric Severide. He worked for uh, CBS and Walter Cronkite. But what Eric did, he made a lot of people unhappy and uncomfortable most of the time with his editorials because he would offer a point of view with two or three different variations. Now think about that for a minute. Is that an editorial? Well, that's a commentary. But he would always end up with more than one point of view. So how do we go about figuring out which is the right point of view? Well, we, we I, the point is there is more than one point of view to just about every subject you want to bring up. And that's our, that's our, uh, that's our promise in journalism is to get to the truth and find the point of view that, that is accurate. But there are many points of view. So how do we go about dealing with the point of view and getting right to it. What is news and what is fake news? Let's get to our guests right now. And it's a pleasure to have them with us because they, they've been in this business for some time and they deal with truth every day. They know all about the word. And I want to start with Angie uh, Holland, who is from PolitiFact. Now, PolitiFact, hi, Angie. Good morning. PolitiFact, I love your subject because it deals with politics and it deals with facts and what the facts are every day. Tell us how you deal with your job and just what you do and how you do it. Well, John, it's great to be here. Thanks for having me. I am a professional fact checker. I am the editor in chief of PolitiFact. Yep. Uh, every weekday we publish new reports about what's being said and whether it's true or false. Our focus is on U.S. politics. So we fact check elected officials. We fact check um, candidates for office. We fact check advocates. And, and all of our reports are basically the same way. First, we identify the fact in question. And I'll just say a fact is an assessment of information with an objective reality that can be verified. So if it's a fact, I should be able to check it. You should be able to check it. Everybody watching it should be able to check it. And we should have evidence that we can point to. An opinion, on the other hand, is a description of, of reality with a qualitative assessment. So you're saying is something good or bad, usually. There's some other aspects to it. But an opinion is like, you know, looking at the world and then, and then saying, like, do I think this is positive or negative? That's different from a fact. Sure. Hopefully. Uh, hopefully. What, I love about that, what I love about it, it changes. It changes, right? Opinion changes. So do facts change? Yeah. Opinions change. A specific fact may change over the course of time. Like today, I'm wearing right. a red shirt. Tomorrow, I may, may be wearing a blue shirt. But we should be able to tell on any given time what the state of reality is. I've been doing this for a bunch of years, and it's been really interesting to see how information has evolved on the Internet. Because when I first started, there weren't as many sources. It felt easier to determine what was a fact or what wasn't. 
Now we've got so many sources and there are some tricksters out there. So we have to be very careful about assessing reality. Yeah, they manipulate the truth when it doesn't serve their purposes. And that's what our job, that's when our job kicks in. Uh, we've got another veteran journalist with us this morning. That's the political editor of the Tampa Bay Times. And it's a pleasure to have Steve Contarno with us. Steve, good morning. Welcome. Good morning. Thank you so much for having me. It's great to be here. You bet. Tell us about your job, what you do, and how you go about doing it. Yeah, so uh, I cover politics in Florida, which is never boring here. We have uh, a former president living here, and we have three Republicans who want to be president uh, uh, in the future, so they keep us busy. And, uh, you know, I think this is a really uh, critical time in journalism right now. We, you know, we live in a world where the facts are questioned all the time. And not only is my job lately to suss out the truth that politicians are saying, but there's a whole uh, ecosphere of, of misinformation that's lurking out there right now that is far more insidious than we have seen uh, in, in previous uh, years. I, I mean, the stuff that we're dealing with on a day-to-day -day basis right now is brewing underneath the surface in parts of the internet and parts of, of culture that we don't often get to see. Uh, and so I think right now teaching young journalists how to find not only when that misinformation makes it into the general zeitgeist, but also sort of where it's percolating below the surface um, and getting an understanding of where it's coming from uh, so you can sort of uh, monitor it uh, before it before it brews in and becomes, you know, Invermectin is suddenly a way to treat uh, COVID, you know? <laughs> uh, absolutely. Uh, thank you very much. I, I'm going to get back to both of you here in just, just a second. Uh, there's something I want to do right now. In fact, now that you've gone over your backgrounds, I'm going to go over mine a little bit in a way that, that I, I've done it all my life, and that's on television. So I've got a produced video here that I'm going to show you that's going to take you through my career a little bit over the past, and I almost hate to say it, 53 years of radio and television. So watch your screen now. All right, go ahead and roll it. What we said on the news is the easiest part of what we do. Sitting here, reading scripts, reading off teleprompters, trying to get through ad libs, uh, all of that is relatively simple. What really is the workhorse of this, this profession is being on the scene is being where it is and talking to the people and corroborating what they say and how do you know what you know and the only way you do that is to get out is to, and be part of it and this is where the stage is set for a showdown between striking miners who want to work and those who don't good evening i'm john wilson reporting live from all of this gasparilla insanity from franklin street mall in downtown tampa this is kohimar beach outside havana cuba if you can call this a beach it's lava rock that's sharp with jagged edges that will cut through rubber sole shoes but almost everybody here has rubber sole shoes in one way or another or canvas or leather there are no boots out here the most distinguishing feature of the Forrestal when she joined the fleet in 1955 was her sheer size, 1,076 feet long. I want to be in a police car. I want to be on a fire truck. I want to be in a jet plane. And I've done all of those things. Those are the moments when you can speak with authority because you can say, I've been there. I've done that. Well, there you go. That's a little bit about, uh, about my life. And I appreciate you suffering through all, <laughs> all of that. Uh, Angie and Steve, let me ask you this. Uh, we deal in, this is really about fact checking here. How do you both go about fact checking? And what is fact checking? And, and, and you know, considering all the people we have to deal with, particularly with politicians, and that's your specialty, how, where do you even start? Angie, go ahead. You, where would you begin? Well, we have a process. So we start with going to the person who made the claim and we ask them, what is your evidence for this? And uh, oftentimes we get a response of them saying, well, I have this study or I have this press report or there was a government uh, committee that looked at it. 
sometimes they don't respond at all. That's interesting as well. And then we go and do our own research. And really, this is very topic driven. So it depends on what the topic is. So if someone is making a claim about, say, taxes, like the government's going to raise your taxes, we go to the laws, we look through the laws, we talk to experts who monitor tax law, we look at what the policies are that are put out by the candidates, and then we make an assessment. We often see false claims that someone plans to raise people's taxes when usually there are no plans like that. Um, although sometimes taxes are raised, I should say, and we're in the middle of some of this discussion right now. But let's, but the topics can vary a lot. So like taxes is one topic. Another one would be COVID-19. We've devoted so much energy this past year to fact checking COVID-19. And there's just a lot of misinformation. People point to studies that either don't say what people say they say, or they weren't peer reviewed studies. They were basically just someone typing at a computer. So we're always looking for private, we're always looking for primary sources. We're always looking for information that's been reviewed by multiple experts. And um, we're looking for, for things that are real. And often what we find with fake news is people are either making things up, they're distorting, or they're taking something completely out of context. So when you're used to looking at things like this and saying, does this have evidence or not? it often becomes clear with just sometimes even a, a, just a few minutes of searching. Sometimes it's not even that difficult to say like, well, this is clearly nonsense. Steve, this is, uh, you mentioned it a while ago, the times that we are in now seem to uh, support uh, changing the facts every day, uh, dealing with the truth, uh, how we want to deal with it, not necessarily what the truth is, but how do you go about uh, dealing directly with with something you suspect right off the beginning is not accurate or true from a from a basic point of view. Where do you begin? Well, luckily, I worked for Angie at Politifact for a couple of years, so I have some uh, some research skills that I picked up from Politifact, and uh, and it's a really important skill set that I think a lot of journalists would would be well suited to learn. Um, you know, it's a lot of of we, there was a there was a time where we did a lot a lot of political journalism was uh, was getting Democrats and Republicans to comment on an issue and I think we've moved more toward an understanding that our job as reporters is to focus on our, the truth and our commitment must be to highlighting the truth uh, no matter if it's coming from a Democrat or coming from a Republican or, or or neither so that's kind of where I come from every topic I cover and every story I, 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 I embark on. Um, and, you know, there's so much information out there that's misinformation, but there's also so much information readily available to reporters that is that and that is easily accessible facts. And, um, you know, one of the things I first things I do when I take on a topic is to see if PolitiFact's already tackled it, because not only does PolitiFact do the fact checking work, but they always show where their stuff is coming from. So I can go back and use that information uh, when I write my own stories. Um, there's also other fact checking organizations out there as well. Um, but it's really just holding, you know, our job as reporters is to hold politicians accountable. So when someone says something that isn't accurate, our job is to, to call them out on it. And, uh, you know, for example, uh, this winter after you know, the January 6th uh, Capitol uprising. And there was a comment that came from uh, one of our state uh, congressmen, uh, Matt Gates, and suggesting that on, you know, hours after this, this bloody uh, insurrection takes place, that, that the individuals involved were likely uh, Antifa um, related. And this tracking where th he got that information and how it blew up and then how he influenced the further spread of this misinformation um, was an important exercise in showing people how something goes from the far corners of the internet to mainstream conservative media in the span of a few hours. And we wrote that story uh, actually working very closely at the time with someone at PolitiFact to sort of track where this started how it got to Matt Gates's lips and then how it becomes 
re repeated on Fox News later that day and showing just the trajectory of, of, a, of something from uh, a, mis a lie on the internet to misinformation that's uh, public is really important part of our work now. Well, you've raised a lot of issues here. I, I'm, I'm going to bring them up as we, as we move along, but I've got a question here from a viewer, uh, Lucas Figueroa from CCNN Live. In more local stories, here's the question. For example, a new museum. How can we check our sources? How do I know if a museum attendee is telling the truth? This here's where we have to rely on on people who cop to be experts and we don't know who they are and yet we're interviewing them. So how do we do that? Angie, you want to take that? Sure. I, I love this question because it, it really does go to the heart of reporting. And there, there's a couple of different ways to approach this. Like when I would be out interviewing people, like the first thing I would do is say, can I get your full name and your phone number? I'm, I'm not going to print it, but it's in case I have any questions later. Yeah. Um, so in that way, you're basically verifying that they are who they say they are because you call them back, you make sure it's them, you get their full name, you can Google it, uh, and you can you can move forward like that. Um, we have seen increasingly in the politics world, whenever you're dealing with a political issue, sometimes political operatives are trying to pass themselves off as everyday normal people who don't have an interest. <laughs> Right. When really they're being paid to advocate. So you need to be really careful there. And again, like the deep Google is your friend. I mean, and then there are also some databases like you can, like you get the person's name. Uh, you can put them into Google. You can see what they've said before. You can see what public records show about them. Um, making sure that people are who they say they are is critically important. And a lot of times it's just being sure to check. I mean, like, is it possible that someone has, has created such an elaborate um, uh, identity that they can hide themselves? Sure, but most people do not go to that much trouble. Most of the time, like, reporters get um, a bad surprise because they didn't check, they didn't look, they didn't go through the databases that we have access to. Steve, you wanna jump in here on this? Yeah, I have a couple thoughts. You know, I think one of the things you can do when you get to a scene, if you're doing a story on something opening or some, you know, a crime that's been committed, or is just talk to a lot of people who are there. Um, you know, I think we've learned over time that eyewitness uh, uh, reports often um, are often incorrect. People misremember things as soon as you know a couple hours after it happened. So, getting a lot of different uh, views from the scene can be a really, really helpful way to sort of piece together what happened instead of just re relying on on one individual. Um, and then, but you know, there's a lot of times where <clears throat> um, where you're going to places to talk to people um, who you know might have a skewed view of reality. Um, I'm thinking about you know going to political rallies. You know, there's a lot of Trump rallies where you're talking to people and they're often repeating you things that you know are misinformation. I also attended QAnon events uh, that took place in, in Florida, um, where it's especially prevalent. Right now we are you know, in Telegram uh, boards, listening to people talk about um, auditing elections, You know that this whole thing in Arizona is actually moving into other parts of the country. Um, when, you're, when, I'm, when I'm in those spaces, um, I'm talking to people not to collect information that I'm going to relay to readers as facts, but understanding um, sort of how prevalent this problem is and getting a better understanding of where they're, where they're getting this information from. So I can tell readers, you know, these, this is how a Q, something goes from the, the dark corners of the internet to a bunch of people showing up to a Save Our Children rally in Polk County, thinking that there's you know, sex trafficking going on uh, in their backyards, you know? So, um, and when you have those conversations with, with local people, even if, I think one thing like, you there's, there's a knee jerk reaction to wanna be like, to challenge them and to, um, to say like, well, you're wrong about this, or I know this to be untrue. And I think that's important when you're challenging authority or asking politicians or lawmakers or 
or you know business owners or whatever to sort of you you want to come up with a, a set of questions to challenge you know what they're claiming to be true but when you're talking everyday people i think your job is to just absorb as much information as possible on on their on how how they shape their worldview and so you can get a better understanding of of where the reality is on the ground right now all right now i've got one for you both because this is a good question here uh, another good one because it it deals with a subject that we all face in our professions is how do you report the story quickly and accurately how do you get it in print and how do you how do we get it on the air uh I, i've got I've got issues with this one, and this is this hits all of us right between the eyes, because we all have these responsibilities to get the story and get the facts straight, and yet we've got deadlines here for publication. So, Angie, you want to go? Sure. I think the most important thing in the breaking news situation is do not pass on any information that you have doubts about. Um, I think it's really important to go to primary sources. So. You can start working on your report while you're sending off emails to public officials or to, I mean, again, it depends on the context, um, but it is really important. Like if, if, the, if, if another news organization comes out with a report and says, oh, this public official has said this, you need to get in touch with that public official through their press office or whatever their representative is and confirm it yourself. And you can start writing while you're doing this reporting, which is like, I mean, I, Frankly, I think that's the the secret of speed, is to multitask and and prep ahead before you publish. But do not press that publish button uh, until you are darn sure that you've got the facts right. Yeah, Steve, um, how, how do you deal with this? Yeah, this is our biggest struggle, uh, I think, as probably an industry right now, where especially you have breaking news happening and there are. TV cameras and internet broadcasts that are just like constantly updating with um, information in real time. I, I, I think the, the most important thing to say is it's more important to be right than to be first. And uh, your credibility will be hurt, hurt forever if, if you publish something incorrect uh, in a rush to be first. Um, at the same time, it can be really difficult because um, in breaking new situations, often the information coming from authorities is sometimes wrong. I, I would recommend everyone here read Columbine, um, a book on the you know school shooting in the 90s, uh, where this idea that there was a you know a third shooter um, was this prevalent uh, thing that actually got pushed by one of the law enforcement agencies on the scene, and then it got repeated, and and sooner or later you know there were people and witnesses who who were imagining they had seen a third shooter as well, even though it wasn't true. So it's a really difficult thing. Um, I think you ultimately just have to only report what you're able to know, what you actually know. Um, I have the unfortunate distinction of having covered several mass shootings. And I think some of my proudest moments in that coverage was not what I reported, but what I kept out of the story because I couldn't confirm it to be true, that later it turned out to be false. Um, that happened quite a bit when I was in Newtown, when, there, when there's the, the, um, the sad school shooting up there. Um, there were reports that were coming out all the time uh, in, from NBC and national news outlets on Twitter um, that I couldn't verify. And my bosses were hounding me like, is this true? Can we report it to these? And I, this, uh, and I would say this is the exact opposite of what I'm hearing, but I can't report it. So I think one of the things you can do and one of the things we need to get more comfortable with is telling our readers and viewers bluntly what we don't know. I think it's fair to say this is what we don't know right now um, versus leaving it out or, or, or publishing something that is, you know, attributed to, um, anonymous sources or, or other outlets that we can't confirm on our own. Boy, this is a real hot topic here because for television, it's the same problem. We have to commit ourselves on the air without basic information sometimes. And it's just ridiculous. Those situations put us in and management wants us to get on the air because competition is on the air or mm -hmm. be on the air. So we're driven by competition. And do you want to say something? Yeah, I mean, I think the best question to pose to your sources in a breaking news situation is, how do you know this? And that's yeah, true, yeah, yeah. whether it's an official or a bystander, because if the answer is, well, I heard it from somebody else, that's not a good answer. If the answer is, you know, I saw it with my own eyes, 
or I was at the scene and I know it to be true. I mean, those are good answers. I mean, there, there's been some very interesting reporting over the years of how even public officials can repeat things that they have just heard. I mean, that's like the terrible shooting um, of then Congresswoman Gabby Giffords. There were brief reports that she had died when she hadn't. She hadn't. And it was from sources right. who right. were repeating things that they didn't know to be true directly. So if you ask your sources, how do you know this? You're going to you're going to get you're going to get something back that's going to tell you is this primary observation or is this just a rumor? Now this raises a real good question and it's the next question I've got here. What is the best source to use when a story is breaking and you've got to commit yourself to a point of view or to a story or to a detail? What is the best source to use? All right, Steve, you want to take it? Well, uh, it's, it's hard. That was a hard. tough one in real time. Um, the, the, the great thing is, is that, you know, if it's something is happening in real time, there's it's we also we can get information in, in real time from from Googling, from research that's already out there, you know. Um, but when, you know, the first cases of coronavirus arrived, there was so much happening in Florida and we, you know, and it's hard to um, fit. You have to kind of like figure out, well, what are the things that we want to convey to our readers right now? And, um, you know, the, the people who are are involved, uh, you know, public officials, um, those are the kind of people that unfortunately you have to rely on those kind of situations who might have uh, incomplete information. So um, I, it's, it's it's a, it's always evolving. I mean, it's it's firsthand accounts. It's 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 things that people see with their own eyes. Um, it's uh, um, you know reports that are coming out in real time. You know, usually there's a, a first person police report if it's a, if it's a, a shooting or if it's um, uh, you know it, there's a lot of different. It's it's, it's I, I'm trying to think of a, a situation where where um, you're you have to get beyond the uh the firsthand account but that's essentially what it is you're you're hoping that the right. that the public officials who are on the scene who are relaying this information to to the the, the media and the general public um have are, are sharing accurate information but i think you also have to come armed to that situation with a lot of questions um some skepticism um and you know probing uh in questions that are going to get more information that you can relate to your readers I want to go uh, back to something you said a little while ago, Angie. We were talking about uh, PolitiFact and what, what it is when you were describing it. Uh, you, you, you raise a real good question in here. And it's about a word that always scares us to death in journalism is accuracy. How accurate are these subjects and these sources that we have? So uh, you've got some thoughts about that and something we've got pre-recorded. Do you want to introduce it now? Sure. I, I mean, actually, I think we could just roll to the video. I think it speaks for itself. All right, let's see it. Here to enact the PolitiFact agenda. We'll need the internet, some spreadsheets, a few experts on speed dial, and a library card. Definitely a library card. Hey, everybody, it's Angie from PolitiFact. And we get this question a lot. What is PolitiFact's agenda? Well, our agenda is simple. It's to give citizens the information they need to govern themselves in a democracy. We started PolitiFact in 2007 at a newspaper, the Tampa Bay Times, with the goal of reporting on the 2008 election by fact-checking it. We've been fact-checking ever since, and now we're a nonprofit national newsroom at the Pointer Institute for Media Studies. The Pointer Institute is a nonprofit too, with the goal of improving journalism and informing citizens. So the PolitiFact agenda is work hard to find the facts. We want to help people understand the issues of the day by reading our fact-checking reports. So we look for data, we consult experts, we search high and low for the most credible, authoritative information. Librarians are our friends. The PolitiFact agenda is, don't take sides with any politician or party. We're independent and we work hard to find the truth. So we follow the facts wherever they take us, regardless of who made the claim. The PolitiFact agenda is be a self-sustaining newsroom. We support ourselves with contributions from readers like you, with online advertising, with selling our content to other newsrooms and tech platforms, and through a small number of grants. 
The most important thing here is nobody tells us what to fact check or what our ratings should be. Only journalists get to operate the truth in leader. Fact checking, fact checking. Yeah, yeah. I, I've got a question here uh, for both of you here. Um, Andrew Odieres, how can I tell both sides of a story when only one side is available and I'm unable to tell the other side? And you have a deadline on you. You got you. We got a story to deal with. I have to put it on television, or you've got to print it. How how can you tell both sides of a story when only one side is available? All right, Steve. Well, first thing is, I would say you have to exhaust every effort possible to try to get in touch with the other side and to get all the information from from that person. Um, you know, if someone's lo lobbying accusations about another politician or or something like that, you know. You need to call their office. You need to email their office. You need to find them on Twitter and send them Twitter messages. If you can chase them down in the, you know, uh, at an event or knock on a door, do all those things. That's really important. Um, and then I think you, you that way you could also tell your readers that you did all those things because I think they're going to look at the story and wonder why didn't you ask, you know, Representative so and so. And so um, you can so that you could say then we left three messages five text messages and whatever. Um, and I do that a lot. Um, the other thing you can do is find other statements that the individual has made um, about the subject. Um, if it's a timely thing and it's come up uh, before, um, you can find time, you know, a lot of, a lot of politicians are now um, sharing their thoughts in real time on Twitter and you can, you know, reference what they've said on Twitter. Um, otherwise you can search for their other interviews they've given on the subject um, to sort of give their perspective uh, if they don't want to. But I mean, you can't force someone to talk, um, but you can uh, find find past statements for them and give your readers a sense uh, that you've made the, a really hard effort to give that opinion. Angie, you want to get in here? This is this really gets to me, too, because we all have to commit ourselves to a certain point of view at some point to publish a story or put it on the air. Uh, and when you've got only one side, what do you do? Yeah, a couple of thoughts here. Number one, if you are trying to get a hold of somebody and you can't reach them, put that in your story. It is absolutely yeah. critical. Yeah. Right. The audience is so sensitive to this issue. Every time at PolitiFact, we have a policy of trying to reach the person who spoke. If we can't reach them and the few times we happen to forget that we put to put in the story that we tried to reach them, we always get messages from readers like you didn't even try to reach them. So you cannot assume that the audience uh, is going to think that you tried. You have to put into your report, we tried to reach this person and could not reach them. So that's the first thing. The second thing is, um, with a lot of these issues, we are not reporting in a vacuum. There's been previous reporting done before. Other news organizations have covered the issue. And it's possible to, to, to use some of that previous reporting to, to fairly and concisely show the other side. Now, you don't want to put words in their mouth or get carried away, but you can easily say, like, in the past, this elected official has said that they support the policy because of this. So simple things like that. And I really can't emphasize enough how much we work right now in a journalism ecosystem where we look at what other journalists are doing, um, we create our own hierarchies of which uh, journalism organizations are the most trustworthy. Um, we build on each other's previous reporting and we cite it appropriately. And, and that's another way to show one side if you can't get it yourself is to draw on reporting that you trust, underline that you trust. You have to be very careful in these areas when you're using other people's work. Um, but it is possible to show both sides completely and fully and fairly, even if you can't directly reach one side, you can draw another reporting for it. I've got a subject now that I, uh, <laughs> this is really, this is like sets the building on fire here because we're going into politics and the election. Uh, his name is Rick Brunson. And here's what he says. Yesterday, Karen Fan, the Republican president of the Arizona Senate said, truth is truth, the numbers are numbers. And accepting the results of her state's controversial audit of the 2020 election that showed once again that Biden 
one. That statement, she says, needs to be the rock solid cornerstone of reality. All Americans need to start with in order for us to move our republic forward. Question is, how do we get a critical mass of people to accept facts as the basis of reality? All right. Who wants to jump into this? Either one. I'll go ahead. Go ahead, Angie. Yeah. <laughs> I, I would say this question points to some of the limitations of journalism. It is not journalists' role to force people to accept things they don't want to accept. That Number one, uh, it's not our job. Number two, even if we decided it was, we would not be very good at it. I mean, in, in some ways, this, uh, this problem of people who do not accept facts is a, a society-wide problem. And according to most of the research that I've looked at, the people who are most influential on them are their own peer groups, not journalists, not people on the Internet, not people far away, but their own family and friends. So I think asking journalists, like, why can't you make more people accept reality is like, that's not something journalists really are, are capable of doing. It's more like, um, how are we as a culture, as a society, among our family and friends, how are we encouraging factuality? And that's a job for everybody. That's a job exactly. for everybody. Exactly. Yeah, the last, yeah. Thing we, last thing we all want to do is to be included as part of the political process. We can't be part of it. Steve, go ahead. Well, that's exactly it. And I think a lot of journalists and reporters have gotten in trouble in the last um, few years as social media has propagated and we all are kind of you know, trying to be brands as well as reporters is that, you know, you're entering the space in social media um, and everything you say and put on social media is being judged in the greater context of what's happening in the world. And what you put out there is going to be judged against the reporting you put out there as well. So if you are sharing um, biases and, 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 and putting um, uh, your opinions out there, People are going to notice that and they're going to use that against you when you are trying to report on facts that they may be stubbornly rejecting. Uh, so I would say it's incumbent on all of us as journalists, first and foremost, um, to really take up that mantle of objectivity um, and be willing to, um, you know, call call a spade a spade, but do it um, uh, universally and, and fairly um, and accurately. Um, because Angie's right. I mean, yesterday I was looking into, I was on Telegram, um, where a lot of these, um, these people who are pushing a lot of these alternative, uh, facts, uh, out there. And there, as their auto report was coming in, you know, they were refusing to believe the results. Some of them were saying things like, um, they probably got to the family of the people who were doing the audit and, you know, threatened them you know, the deep state, uh, you know, was threatening people to to you know go along with with uh, with with this idea that Biden won. You know, and and I I can't jump in there and be like, actually, if you look at X Y Z, you're not gonna you're not gonna move those people. Over time, though, you know, we can do a lot to improve the public's ability to trust us, as well as teaching news literacy and giving people a better understanding of what we do and how we do it, so that they know that we, they can come to us. Uh, for information. All right, let me uh, just bring up a point here. The clock is racing against us right now, and I might suggest you try try to keep your keep your answer. You're really good, both of you. You're experts on this subject. Just keep in mind the clock is working against us right now. Uh, here's Ryan Santos. When reporting on a story with multiple points of view, how do I keep a story unbiased? Angie. Yeah, I think the primary obligation journalists have is to the truth. So I would not try to balance the story like like I'm going to give three paragraphs to this side and three paragraphs to this side and then I'm going to be done. A lot of times we call that like false balance. Um, you need to assess like you need to do all your reporting, assess all the information independently and then give people what's true. Because if you're doing anything else, I'd say like, it, it, I mean, it's not really journalism. Um, now we do have to worry about tone, and a lot of a lot of charges of bias that I deal with come down to to questions of tone, and it's really hard. 
because you want to seem authoritative. You want to be witty in some ways. You want to write in a way that's engaging. But you have to be really careful because like what you think is witty, someone else might see as snarky. Um, what you think is analytical, some other people might think as patronizing. And like that is when you really have to put your hands on the copy and, and like it's not something that you can deal with in generalities. You have to be very specific about it. You know, what I like about this point in our discussion is that we're we're kind of at a at a breaking point here in terms of our philosophies, because what what has been suggested in some of these questions is really commentary. It's not reporting in journalism that those are two entirely different things here. And journalism sometimes mixes up. Uh, you guys don't. And that's what the, the, the Tampa Bay Times is noted for. And that's why you are here. Uh, but this leads me into, into my next question. Ainsley Vetter, University of Miami. How do you get the real truth to people that rely on social media that's spreading false information? All right, Steve. I mean, that's that's becoming a huge problem is that people are getting their news in silos and they're not, you know, they feel that they can't. There are so there's so many ways for them to get information um, through the filters that they prefer uh, and that we are not in those spaces. I think that, you know, the best, you know, we we're, we have a growing Instagram presence, you know, for example, where we're seeing a lot of like fake news. We saw a lot of fake news spread in, in the 2020 election. That's a space that we're trying to get in uh, more and more. And that's it's easier to have a dialogue back and forth with with readers because they're commenting there and we can you know come back at them and say, actually, this is X, Y, Z. So that's one thing that we do is I think we are more active in monitoring um, our own our own feeds for misinformation when people are posting comments. But, um, you know, we're not on YouTube right now. Like the Tampa Bay Times is not actively uh, on YouTube. And that's where a lot of misinformation is spreading, especially in, you know, for example, uh, foreign language spaces. That's a huge, huge blind spot for the news media industry right now. Um, and I don't know how to solve those, those problems. I think that it's incumbent on all of us um, to be in those spaces, to be working in those spaces um, and to keep an eye on them and monitor them for when fake news is bubbling up there. Um, but it's it's really, really hard. And I don't think we've discovered the best way to make sure that our facts are getting in front of people, especially when the gatekeepers like Facebook and YouTube have very, you know, have algorithms that, you know, tend to push people into the silos that they've already put themselves in. All right. I uh, want to bring this up now because we, we're really uh, dealing with an issue here worldwide that's become just incredibly difficult for all of us, and that's COVID. Uh, it's really gotten the attention of just about everybody on this planet. A lot of people don't know about it in some of these countries, but most people do. And there are many, many different points of view. I want you to, uh, our viewers to watch this about COVID. Take a look at it. Variants are on the rise. There's Wolverine, Professor X, Jean Grey. Oh wait, not those mutants. We're talking about the so-called mutant variants of COVID-19, the Delta variant, the Beta variant, the Gamma variant. We found a social media post recently that claimed the COVID variants are on the rise. And that's true, they are. But it also put the blame on vaccination for the variants. And that's just plain wrong. It's time for a truth -a meter Minute. Hey there, it's Josie with PolitiFact. We're always checking out things we see on social media and ideas readers send us. We're looking to debunk misinformation. Recently, we came across this claim about the COVID-19 variants. The post says, Just to be clear, scientifically, it is the vaccinated, not the unvaccinated, spreading mutant variants. This is from inoculating during the pandemic with a poor neutralizing vaccine. This is what has happened with numerous other leaky, non-neutralizing vaccines. No. It's not. So what is a variant? A variant of the COVID-19 virus is one that has mutated in a way that bolsters its spread or severity compared to the original strain that emerged in Wuhan, China. Time for the verdict. A Facebook post claimed that it is vaccinated people, not unvaccinated, who spread mutant variants of COVID-19. That rates false. The so-called mutant variants appeared on the scene before there was widespread vaccination. Vaccinated people who become infected with COVID-19 are able to transmit the virus. But studies show that unvaccinated people are more likely to both contract and spread the Delta variant. 
Well, this subject gives us all pause. I, uh, this is a good point for us to, and me to ask you, and you start with you and then Steve, uh, just how you deal with these COVID reports and uh, the, the fact checking aspect of it, because fact checking in this case is extremely difficult. So how do you start? when you've got a subject in front of you involving COVID? The COVID fact checking we've been doing has been all consuming. It's been uh, unlike any other news um, event I've seen in my career. And we've all, all the journalists of PolitiFact, we've had to become science reporters, really. Um, one of the things that makes COVID fact checking complicated is that it's a new virus the scientists themselves are still figuring it out and the expertise on it is still being developed. Um, one of the things I get a little bit frustrated about is people are like, you know, oh, the journalism around COVID is, is not good because people are confused. Well, it's not the journalism that's, <laughs> it's, it's a genuinely confusing situation. I'm, I'm not sure how journalists are supposed to come in and take something that is just genuinely confusing and then well, I, I, will t I will tell you why because they're looking to us they're looking to journalism and journalists like you to tell me tell me the truth here what is the truth of this thing so what we're doing is we're looking at the sources we're looking for sources who are the most scientifically oriented so that's uh, usually doctors epidemiologists people affiliated with major research institutions who are really invested in the, the knowledge of this disease and have the background to understand it. And those are our primary sources for this story. Now that video showed somebody who just goes and posts on the internet and is like, well, I think it's because of this, you know, and they're not. And when you look into the, when you look into the background of these people who post on the internet, um, sometimes they're doctors, but they're not epidemiologists. You know, we've seen like osteopaths and, and chiropractors and people who really don't have expert in the, in the disease. And then unfortunately, but this is just the way it is, like COVID has been so politicized. Like there's an anti-vaccine movement that just does not care what the evidence shows. They're gonna keep putting out messages that denigrate the vaccines. And um, and it's just, it, it, it's a very, it's well, a very you know, difficult situation. This is a really good place for print and for, for you two and all of your associates in, in journalism, print journalism in particular, to get this record straight, because you turn on broadcast networks today, and depending on whichever one you're watching, you get a particular point of view that may be in direct conflict with something I just saw over here or over there. Uh, <clears throat> you have any advice for Take yourself away from your employer right now. Tell me as a, as a, as a viewer and a reader, how do I... How do I search this truth? How do I decide what's right and what's not? Where do you go? I encourage people to find a news source that they trust to look at it very carefully and then to stick with it. So I, I love the, the major newspapers of the country, the New York Times, the Washington Post, the Wall Street Journal, USA Today. The local newspapers are very good. The Tampa Bay Times is very good. I was mm -hmm. home in Louisiana recently um, the, the Daily Advertiser is the newspaper for Lafayette, Louisiana, and it's publishing authoritative vetted reports. Um, so I would not just be a victim to the feeds on your phone. I would I would pick a news source and follow it and make sure it's a credible, accurate news source. Steve, you got some hints here? Yeah, I mean, if the Facebook post is from, you know, uh, worldtruthnews.com, net slash org you know that's pretty a good a good starting sign so i would say that there's uh, don't trust everything you 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 see on facebook you know you really want to see the source of what you're getting at and what, what's coming at you because there's entire um factories of of in other countries where they're intentionally creating posts that they think will go viral with the intention of generating ad revenue, um, not really caring for accuracy of the facts. So uh, one of the things that our organization has done um, throughout the pandemic that I think has been really helpful is writing explainers that are often answering the questions that we're hearing from readers. So, you know, it's not the typical, you know, inverted pyramid style story. It's more of what are the things that people are Googling about this topic 
What do they want to know about COVID? What do they need to know about booster shots? Now these are in the news. What do they need to know about sending whether or not my kid needs to wear a mask? Anticipating the questions that your reader is going to ask and then presenting it in that format with question, answer, question, answer. Um, and if you could put a good headline on it that has a good SEO generated uh, uh, headline, you'll find that people when they're Googling it are being steer steered towards your your coverage. So that's something that I think that we've done really well. Another thing is layering information throughout a story, even if it's not, if it's a political story about coronavirus and someone says something that you know is incorrect, but it's coming from, you know, the house majority leader. So you want to make sure, so they, you know, you have to, you, you feel obligated to, to put their opinion in there or whatever. Um, you have to, you know, you could say things like, you know, the vast majority of public health experts believe dot, 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 and putting that in the next graph so that people can see that information juxtaposed against what the, the general consensus is. Also, you know, your, your stories these days online, there's ways to layer in context by putting in hyperlinks or, or, say, or, or ways for them to click and read more. Um, so finding as many ways you can to surround um, um, conversation about COVID with facts um, and with, you know, medical consensus opinion uh, is a way that you can sort of blunt the effects of, of misstatements. This kind of duplicates your answers, both answers. But I, I'm, as a viewer, I'm, I'm sitting here trying to figure out how do you decide when two people are telling you two different things, which one to believe? Where do you start, Angie? Well, I go back to the question I mentioned earlier. How do you know this? I think that's really critical. Yeah. yeah. Uh, even with COVID experts, uh, you know, there's a, there's a, are you like, if, let's say you talk to two experts, are you going to, and you say, how do you know this? And one of them says, well, I read it on the internet. And the other one says, well, I've been studying viruses right. for right. most of my career and I've written papers on it. And, and I, I look at the, you know, I mean, I'm not a scientist. So like, I, like, I know they don't look at viruses under a microscope, but like, you know, they're like, and here's my research and my experiments. Are you going to believe that person? Or are you going to believe the person who is like, oh, I heard it from one of my friends on the internet. I mean, I'm going to believe the person who seems to have the more valid expertise. And it applies to other situations too, like eyewitness situations, you know? And it's not just, um, it's like, how do you know what you know? And, and if you follow that question back, you're, you're, going to, you're going to either reach a conclusion one way or the, another, or you're gonna decide like, this isn't something that we can determine at this time. And sometimes we do come to that conclusion that like the evidence is just too confusing, it's too, we just can't know. But you have to try. You have to do the digging. And, it, and if you do the digging, usually you can reach a conclusion. Well, you've both given us a lot to think about. And I'm sorry to tell you the clock is moving against us right now. Uh, I want to give you a, a moment here now to um, and take, take the time you need to sum up what is important about what we've, the, this ground that we've covered that's so important to all of us and this term fake news that's become such a part of our vocabulary here lately. Uh, just summarize what what we need to walk away from today and what will help us in the future when we when we watch television or when we read the newspaper or decide which paper to read or and I love what you said, Angie, you get your sources straight on what you're where you're getting your information. Uh, but go ahead and sum up what you think is important for us to remember about today. Well, I would say it's a very um, confusing moment in the information universe. So people need to, to bring some, you know, some mindfulness to what they're reading. Um, you can't just say, oh, I'm going to sit back and let the news come to me. That's, I mean, that's just not the moment we're in. So unfortunately, it takes some extra work right now to be an informed journalist, an informed citizen, an informed voter. Um, so really have your wits about you. And we talked a little bit about social media I and mean, we could talk another hour about it. It's really important to watch very carefully on social media. These algorithms are not performing uh, the best when it comes to finding accurate, informative information. Their goal seems to be to keep people amused, entertained and on the platform. So just be really aware 
um, of where you get your news from. Uh, it is important to be open-minded. Like uh, the PolitiFact video said, you know, we don't take sides. I do think that's important. Neither political party has a monopoly on truth or accuracy. Um, having said that, like it's wrong to think that both sides are equal in any political argument. Um, we talked about the vaccines. I think the science is very strong that people who want to preserve their health um, should get vaccinated. And I don't think it's it's biased as a journalist to say that. Um, so that's kind of where we are. It's, it is a very confusing moment. And if people are confused, I get confused too. But I do think if we pay attention to our sources and we look for good, accurate information, we can find it. Yeah, and don't be too quick to commit to one particular source, I guess. Uh, go ahead, Steve. Well, that's a great point and what Angie just brought up too, because look at what we just saw, the, um, the Biden administration claiming that their uh, counter-strike um, after the Afghan blast killed 13 American soldiers, the New York Times had the wherewithal to figure out if, if the counterattack actually did kill a terrorist threat and found that no, it was innocent, an innocent family that, that died. And, you know, that quick accountability to hold the administration accountable shows that there, there isn't a monopoly on the truth. And it's incumbent on all of us to always just be um, suspicious or skeptical. I had, a, I had a, a person who told me, don't be cynical, but always be skeptical. And I feel like that's a really important mindset for people to have. Um, but I also would like to encourage people to, especially young reporters, to go to spaces where um, that are outside of your bubble and where misinformation is percolating because um, it's really important to, to something that the things that are on the fringe enter the mainstream really, really quickly. The Tea Party was a fringe movement in 2009, and it ended up being uh, a groundswell of support for Republicans that led to a total flip of, of the country in 2010. Um, and if it was important for people to be, under, to, for reporters to be in those spaces and sort of say like, hey, this is coming. Um, and I would also say you should approach those situations with, uh, when you're entering spaces where uh, people are, are clearly been um, influenced by misinformation, uh, and their their backgrounds or the or or the news that they're getting that's that's not accurate. Um, always em approach subjects with with humanity and empathy and an understanding that at the end of the day, most people you talk to um, aren't intentionally sharing information um, that they know is wrong to in a in a malicious way. Um, they've been manipulated. They have a they have circumstances in their life that led them to um, to be susceptible to to uh, to misinformation. We see that so much with people who have fallen for QAnon, who have fallen for uh, white nationalist views that they're they came to it from a, a place um, that where their own life was was shaken or they have a troubling background. And the best way to bring to bring information to them. Um, is to do it with empathy and understanding for for that. Um, so I think that's a really important thing that a lot of journalists have, you know, want to talk down um, to people in certain parts of the country, uh, and that's not an effective way to be persuasive at all. No, no. I've got to close this out, and uh, thank you very much, Angie and Steve. You were terrific today. You gave us a lot to think about and to take home and uh, to bring up the next time we have an opportunity to, to get together, wherever it may be, to talk about things <laughs> that, are, that are important to us. I, I would like to say also thanks to all who tried to uh, communicate with us and submit questions. We had a bunch of questions that we didn't have time to get to, and um, we may be able to do it sometime in the future. But again, Steve and Angie, thank you very much. Right. Uh, I guess it's time for me to close this out now and uh, mention a couple of things. One of which well, we've all been talking about change and how we deal with change. And change is about is another word for journalism. Journalism is is about reporting change. Uh, it's when you get mixed up with facts and uh, and and truth that that really kind of run together here. But but journalism, uh, in fact, for us the word truth can set off a three alarm fire. And we're all of us who work in journalism for any period of time know that whenever we hear a statement or we, re we read a fact, our minds are gonna question 
every detail and the origin of that detail and how many how many sources it came from. Um, the, the, the news is often intended to, uh, to, I guess this is personal in a way, because it, I see the news often intended in some cases, depending on the source, to damage someone's reputation or some company. That's not news. That's not news. We, what we've been talking about here today is news that changes in one way or another every day. So I, I, I want to leave you with this thought. Truth can be, can be fluid, depending on the individual who's making a statement or making a point. And honesty in journalism is a word that we all kind of try to, uh, try to live with. Uh, again, I want to thank Steve and Angie for being here and to all of you for watching. And thank you very much and have a good day. On the screen, if you'd like to uh, communicate with us, leave us any thoughts. You see my address up there, John Wilson at Tilly13, AOL.com. That's my address. Uh, Angie said address, Angie uh, Dropnik Holland at aholland at pointer.org and at Angie Holland. And then Steve Conterno, Conterno at tampabay.com at Conterno. Again, uh, it's been wonderful to have these guests, and we again wish you the best and thank you. On behalf of the Suncoast Student Production Awards Committee, thank you for joining us. For more information about our awards, scholarships, or future webinars, go to suncoastchapter.org.